when was the first time that you recall hearing metal music yourself? I think there were probably bits and pieces that I picked up at a friend's house that I had in, well, I don't know what those grades are called in English now, but between fourth and sixth grade, kind of. But I was probably more on the classic hard rock end of things. Like you have uh, your, uh, what are they called? Like the Kiss or Alice Cooper or CC Top and those kind of things. And uh, Black Sabbath was in that house as well. And I was kind of starting to, you know, root create something. But the, the first thing that was a big deal was I have an older brother and from his room, all those, all the Germans who like dragons were playing 24 uh, seven for a period there. And uh, so I had some secondhand intake of Blind Guardian, Gamma Ray and whatnot. And I think then the first time I really, that I borrowed a CD from my brother in the car on the way home from some family vacation, I was 12 and that was Keeper, uh, Keeper of the Seven Keys, part two, Halloween. And that was that, you know, the turning point where it's not that I necessarily jumped to, I gotta sing in a band and all this already, but it was, Definitely some kind of some transaction in regards to my soul happened there. How did you become a vocalist and what vocalists did you look up to when you founded Avatar? Well, right before Avatar, there was another band I was in for a little while um, as a kid, basically. Like, I my parents put me in front of the piano when I was five, and I'm not one of those who sound like they start a piano at five, but I started that young, then I was a trombone in music school and stuff. So music was kind of always around. And when they showed us guitar in school, I had kind of picked that up. So I was um, a, a shitty multi-instrumentalist already as a kid. And the first, this band I was going to join because I played some guitar, played some trombone, some piano, and this was kind of a funk thing. And I was, I just wanted to be in a band. But once I came to rehearse room the first time, um, all the positions were already filled except for singer and and that was that's a scary thing for teenage boys to do so they just oh y you'll do it write write lyrics and uh, and it starts i was kind of put in that position in reality in hindsight i that is probably what i would have wanted to do anyway and the role that seems to have suited me the best and uh, then from this band, they introduced me to uh, John and Jonas and the other, at the time, members of Avatar. And of course, once the other members left that band that were not so serious and insane as me, John and Jonas, and the other guys joined, and we were like 16 years old, I was already, it was very evident that this was more for me than these funk guys that still, you know, friends and whatnot, but Avatar. You know, you had a feeling we could barely play, but or and I could definitely not sing, but still there was that energy of like we're going places. So uh, then I chose chose them. What I looked up to, I think the most important band for Avatar in our formative years, uh, still must it must be the Haunted. Uh, and at the time, what had come out when we formed and I joined were the two first album and then uh, the live album, Live Rounds in Tokyo. And John would play through that live set every day when he practiced. And Jonas tried to reach the guitarist for guitar lessons. And and I was really taking notes and trying to understand what Peter Dolving and Marco Aro was doing. So collectively, among a bunch of other bands, but collectively, The Haunted was such a strong impression like were so important to us and around that um yeah i was already into devon townsend at that time and uh, i liked a bunch of singers that i couldn't sound like as well you know michel kiske of halloween and hans kirsch of blind guardian and the whole power metal gang and also well, lord worm was also very important from cryptops and non so vile was also extremely important for us as a band um when we learn to play, you know, we try to play Phobophile and Slit Your Guts in those songs. And, um, you know, uh, now I try to articulate, but uh, thanks to Lure Worm, I always feel it's it's not always necessary that to hear what a growler sings. It's not the most important part. If you sound like Lure Worm did on non Vile, you know, lyrics are secondary. They're good when you read them, but you don't have to. 
uh, when you started doing growling, were you first doing uh, covers with the band or did you immediately start writing your own music? What kind of memories do you have from the early days? Well, we, yeah, no, there were a bunch of covers that we started out with and uh, the, my audition was to sing Clayman and John's uh, boy room where the drum kit was on a little practice guitar amp. Um, so yeah, we did Clayman, we did Raining Blood, we did uh, Hammer Smashed Face, we did uh, probably some, mo uh, clearly some more that I can't really remember now all of them. And we started to write relatively early, but uh, and, uh, yeah, because our first, yeah, our, our very first show was a band competition in Mundal outside of Gothenburg where we grew up and uh, to be in that competition where you had to have one original song so we did the clayman song we did raining blood uh, we finished with raining blood so in the middle uh, of the set list meaning song two was our first original and uh, so we were forced to start and once that happens like oh we can do better than this and then we were kind of off to the races as you mentioned some of your influences mm. as a vocalist, did you first try to imitate them with singing or were you immediately trying to find your own voice as a vocalist? I think both things kind of happened simultaneously, but it was definitely a, a how does he do that and how do I do that without hurting myself? Um, uh, and I looked at a couple, again, a couple of different ones at the same time. Doing what Devin did felt very unreachable at the time. This very effortless, smooth transition between the styles and level of distortion and intensity, all that. Um, but yeah, no, but trying to figure out again, Marco Auro that on, especially on uh, the Made Me Do It album, had a kind of high pitch thing, barky style, trying to figure that out. At the same time as the Lord Worm is that all those I mentioned, yeah, like trying, trying all on all those different pants, and at the same time in gymnasium or high school for international listeners, I went to this. I had, I was going, I was in a music class. So half the class I had were music, including the choirs and the vocal teaching and whatever. And once the I was starting to learn proper technique for singing in general and starting to learn to apply that to being loud and then not really but still always wanted to push it a bit beyond what I was able to always looking for that physical intensity and not just making it sound right it's always been important I think for all of us that when you play metal it should feel like you play metal like we have very thick strings and we don't trigger the drums so it really has to beat the shit out of the drums and and the same went for the vocals always pushing and I mean, still don't know what my style today would be. I, I, I realize, I guess I sound like me, and but that's still by trying on and learning things from others is just a part of it. Actually, what is that? Um, somewhere, some podcast or something, I heard the story of an art student who did just felt like he was painting like Van Gogh and couldn't didn't find his own style he was just copying his idols and then some teacher told him to you're gonna sit in that room with only that whichever van gogh painting and paint it try to nail it to perfection exactly like it is and all the mistakes you make in that painting that's your style so i mean we um i think a lot of people's style is just whatever whenever we fail at sounding like the people we put on a pedestal and that's just your dna getting in the way in a good way. How long did it take for you to learn the right technique for the singing so that you didn't lose your voice while practicing or playing shows? The, hmm. I mean, the fundamentals of it was already in my, was when we started to play more and I was in my mid to late teens. And but still to this day, it's also something, it's like cardio, something you need to kind of keep going to, to keep the endurance and stuff uh you i feel like you build some what do you say ring rust pretty quickly or at least i do if i don't keep you know go out for the 30 minute run here and there it's the same thing with the vocals but the fundamentals of just uh, 
using um, what do you call it? using not the guts um, uh, the diaphragm and all that and the correct breathing and and controlling the airflow so that you decide how much force you use and all that that started to fall into place pretty early for extreme stuff but I still feel I'm still learning which is part of what I like with our band and how we write and what we decide to do always is there's always some aspect um, where I feel like a beginner and that's important to me that that's part of staying hungry uh, what kind of experience was it to play the first full European tour with the band? It was very special. It was a Bayon tour with uh, Finnish legends Impaled Nazarene. And as you can imagine, we were musically a match made in heaven, of course. So the audience has embraced us with open arms, as you would imagine. Uh, so it was a bit of trial by fire. It was intense. They had gone through... I mean, it's more it's their story to tell whenever, but they had been through a lot already when we joined the last leg of that tour. We were there for like three weeks out of nine or something, and it had been challenging. And we were a lot of bands crammed in in a very, you know, in a bus with too many bunk beds and people were smoking and doing other things on there constantly. So it was a... <laughs> not the healthiest environment, but also a crash course in what touring was like. Um, but I mean, there were a lot of still people such as their drummer, Reima, who really took us under his wings a bit and showed the ropes uh, of just touring mentality and, and uh, attitude and how to behave and stuff very early on. And we did some stupid mistakes as you're supposed to when you're 18, 19 years old. Uh, we got a lot of that out of the way and uh, and you know um, and survived the whole thing so I mean it was amazing but at the time it was very hard and a good test run for us to figure out how to be with each other and stuff in that way and you know so one of the tours I will because it was the first one that I will appreciate the most mm -hmm. have the strongest memories from had the most problem during for all kinds of reasons and and but then that kind of became the building blocks of the foundation upon which all the other touring has been built which has been 99.9% .9 bliss even driving in the van sleeping on the floor in a parking lot somewhere cops wake you up you cannot be here you know all the things we've done we kind of got strong enough to handle because of that tour was it easy to do vocals many days in a row? And did you learn anything from yourself during that tour? Yeah, no, I didn't learn anything because I was young enough to uh, recover from whatever stupidity we did. Um, well, the very first show, actually, we were... Our uh, tour company kind of... We played at... There was another tour going on with Marduk at the same time. And we were all booked for the same show in Prague, which turned it into a little mini festival. And some other shows had been cancelled right before that. So we had just been driving around Germany and getting shit faced. Uh, so, and I was hung over on a level that up until that point in my life, I hadn't been, especially not with something important to do. Then again, I was 19 years old. So I sneezed and, I, and it was gone. Uh, you know, it's a, uh, amazing what a young boy's body can how he can deal with alcohol but uh, so you know you handled the punishment i didn't deal with things in a healthy way there but you got away with it at, due to the age i think and uh, <laughs> just remembering that day a stronger memory than what it was like to sing i guess or learning things from that first tour is just it was the first time i had to speak english on stage and i hadn't thought about it until suddenly the music stopped after their first song and I look at people looking back at me and I look at them and like hello we are Avatar and uh, yes the last one standing you know like it beep total what do call it? um blackout <laughs> in the brain not knowing what to say at all um no but taking care of the voice yeah I learned that um as disgusting as smoking is it's really bad idea to do on the road for a singer for instance and finding time for recovery and but all those things started to kick in more in my mid-20s you started to need it in a different way 
do you have any warm up routines or do you just go on stage and do the warm up during the show? Has that changed from the early days? Yeah, I have had different routines. Now I'm very set in something I have where there are essentially three exercises of running scale or doing arpeggios and just do warming up the full range of the voice. Like you start, you yawn big and so you can stretch out the back of your throat. You do coughing, I cough uh, and you know, it's kind of like this go support things, but I do it in the form of coughing because also clearing my throat and go through all the vowels in the Swedish alphabet because we have nine. So that's a good amount for <laughs> vowel for vowels. And then it's those that one from my lowest to highest register into ah uh, from high to low to high register and back down. And with that one also, when getting really high, I let myself switch into falsetto and then I try to keep a falsetto way deeper than uh, than you um, than I normally would use falsetto because trying to just be in charge of where everything is positioned because one thing is to go out there and just scream a whole show or just sing normal or whatever gently uh, through a whole show but because I jump from one thing to the other to the warm-up is really just to, that I'm in charge of the gear switching and then the last thing is just little scale runs of those staccato things that are also it's just that's also like if, to warm up the mute just the brain to music because it's really doing really short notes like that it's harder to stay in pitch and have precision you know so so it's a bit of a challenging exercise just to you know again get the gears in place before we're going out there and it's like a 12 to 15 minute thing are there some drinks or foods you try to avoid before the show that you feel they affect your vocal cords somehow? I should, but my discipline isn't the best for it. But the most important thing is um, at home, I try to eat twice per day and, thus, and then in between do intermittent fasting. And uh, that means that my meals become pretty big, those two meals, to get everything I need and then time to digest and just time for the body to not have to work on anything. Um, and on tour, that means that ideally, my ideal time for meals have been pushed further and further away from the start of the show, where now I'm the happiest if I am like five to six hours before showtime, it's my last real meal until after we play. And, um, but then I also discover like some of us in the band, we work out pretty hard on the road nowadays and which is you know it takes care of all the because performing is very physical i even have measured and i like the, like burn over two thousand calories in a show and uh, but and then but you do it in not necessarily the most ergonomic yoga compatible way so you do all the muscle building and stretching and and heavy heavy cardio throughout the day to make it that the show isn't the hardest thing you do do and to keep up some kind of energy level and ability through a whole tour. And because with the heavy workouts and the weird times of eating and then the show itself that you try your best to make the heaviest workout of the day, challenging whatever you did before, that means I need probably over 4,000 calories per day on the road. So. So part of me is want to be careful on not too much fried and not something that makes too much mucus happen and, and uh, gluttonous food is not the best for me or whatever and FODMAP being careful with the stomach and, um, and, and, and all trying to keep all those rules in place while also trying to consume your 4,000 calories is a bit of a challenge. So I end up eating at some point <laughs> just stuffing my face. And if I have to do it before the show, then I like to do it six hours before. Yeah. Which albums have been vocally the most important to you to date with Avatar? Are there some albums you can pinpoint that were important for you? Yeah, probably. Well, there's probably a story for that to all of them. I think with the third one, uh, the self-titled one, we really, in the studio, started to take vocals more seriously like the classic thing for a metal band is something 
once the drummer has done what he had to do and everybody done what they have to do, you just go in there, you have two days to just use whatever time is left. And uh, we were tied on time anyway for the first album. We paid for it ourselves. Well, we paid for all the albums ourselves at the, in, in reality. Um, but by the third one, we realized lots more going on vocally and it was a learning curve while writing it and therefore recording it. So it was allowed to take more time and to be more dedicated to it. And it was hard and kicked my confidence, you know, a lot. For the fourth album, first time we worked with a proper you know, producer in the sense of that it says producer on his, uh, on his card, you know, if it gives his um, business card. And he was able to make me way more relaxed and have way more fun with it and just trust that I am me and I'm great, whatever, you know, like, that kind of be yourself and find yourself thing. And that happened the most with Black Waltz. Then, uh, I mean, and then kind of, then that evolved over time with each album and more confidence, better technical ability to do more things. Um, then I, I want to say a turnaround. Hmm. Well, again, they all kind of brought something to the table up until today with uh, Dance Devil Dance where I think very an interesting thing is the dirt I'm buried in that is um, a relatively normally sung song where because the nature of how we approach doing heavy metal there's always some kind of you know really high notes or re being really loud or being really speedy or something and it gets metal by default because you have to push yourself and you sweat a lot while performing and with the dirt and buried in more than ever before i think it was about creating metal in a baritone range range where you know i am i do more like I use a lot of force and noise to kind of hit things like a tenor a lot of the time because it's metal, but I have way more of a natural low range and uh, living in, with that a bit more in songs and still give that teeth is something pivotal that happened as of late. Yeah, I was just going to ask you, you will be releasing the next Avatar album, yeah. Dance Devil Dance, 17th February. Are there some new things you tried with the vocals on the upcoming album? Yeah, so again, the baritone thing, I, uh, I realize it's a bit... Um, not super different. I've been there for a bit, but to really emphasize that throughout a song and making that work. Um, then, what else? Uh, what, which songs are on that album? Uh, <laughs> it's no, uh, well, just what songs are on that album? It well, it's because it's so much. We really lean into the rock and roll on this one. How we recorded it, how we treat it, how we we try to treat the death metal oriented songs more like rock and roll as well, and and uh, and that automatically made it more vocal heavy in a different way than if you do metal there's a lot of a lot of singing going on and uh, it's always that challenge when you're in the studio or when you're writing you write okay this is the verse la -da -da, and i sing, and you know that's a nice verse what can the chorus be then you do the course you do it piece by piece and it takes then once the song is done it can take months between coming up with a song to actually you start rehearsing the song so the first time you sing something from start to finish it's like uh oh i'm in trouble but it's a trouble I like, like this, the track Dance Devil Dance is like that, for instance, where it's just now I have to get even more stamina and endurance to just make it through it. Because it's not that uh, each individual part is not the toughest, trickiest thing I've ever done, but it just keeps going and going and going and just to master that. And then, yeah, there's some falsetto wailing on that one that is reminiscent of some 70s that we end up worshiping all the time it's the uh i don't know if you ordered um if you order the uh, deep purple's child in time off of wish you get the middle part of dance devil dance so that was new for us and um yeah so pieces like that just dealing with more physical intensity and that happens every time because i'm addicted to that feeling of like oh this is really tough and you do an album, you tour it, you raise your bar for what tough is, because then you can do it in your sleep after a while. Like in the first couple of shows we did Paint Me Red back in the day, 
it was such a grueling challenge for me, but now it's really something I usually can do in my sleep. So you raise that bar all the time. It's like, I don't know, my habits of trying to run and by run, I mean jog and by jog, I mean crawl, but I try to do it, you know, longish distances, 10 to 20 Ks and stuff nowadays. But you know, you started with a 15 minute walk. At some point you get really, really bored with that and you just keep pushing it. And I'm a bit addicted to that feeling, to that punishment. From the album, are you most proud of in terms of vocals? Do you have a favorite track? Mm. Um, I can pick, I could pick favorites for very specific reasons that then I could, you know, um, uh, but it's hard to see how they stand against each other from that perspective. And that's a boring political answer, but I guess what excites me vocally a bit extra that was never done before. And therefore it's very special on this album is doing a duet with Alyssa Hale. So uh, violence, no matter what, and and uh, more than performing the duet, I think writing it like that, because, and that came out before asking Lizzie, before knowing who would do it, if it would be Henrik who would have to get very busy while playing bass, or we, there was no exact plan. It's just that the ideas that came were suitable for two people doing it together. And uh, the writing of something like that, um, and not just having a feature part you know, but it harmonizes this call and response and, and both get their moments to shine and all of that, um, proper, a proper duet. I'm pretty proud of having pulled off writing wise, cause that was a, a new little challenge on this album. What your, what was your parents reaction when they noticed that you sing in a heavy metal band? Oh, very easy going. And I think, I mean, I hang in a relatively international crowd but growing up in sweden and living in finland i'm sure you can recognize that in general there are of course exceptions to this but most parents families are kind of supportive and up for it when your kid shows ambition to do a weird quirky thing um it's kind of in i think also because we are relatively small countries where but where we've seen examples of success and recognition outside of just some underground scenes. So like, you know, uh, well, if, you know, if you're a kid growing up in Espo, you have Alexi Lai who has an example, well, he could, why can't I? And, and so on. So and Finland and Sweden are full of examples such as that. So culturally in general, I think people are pretty okay with it. And my parents in particular, you know, just recognized the ambition that went into what we were doing and, uh, and uh, they weren't giving much of a choice, but it was never a bone of contention. I also think because we are welfare states, like you can dedicate yourself to something when you're young, fail miserably, learn a lot from it that you then, if you ever grow up, cut your hair and get a real job, it still was probably a worthwhile time spended to be passionate about something while growing up. And, and that 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 side of it naturally transitioned into it becoming what it slowly has become today. So um, no no big issues. I mean, mom always preferred my trombone playing to my death metal vocals, but uh, they also got used to it. So to the degree that one Christmas she got tickets to see Kevin Costner, and she got to bring that <laughs> as a country band. And from the perspective of being having a crush on him in Dances with Wolves and all of that to seem like it was nice. But musically, she had kind of gotten used to our shows at that point. So it's like, yo, you know, it was fine. He was playing his guitar and, you know, he was so sweet and, and he was high-fiving the grannies in the audience and I was one of them. So that was cool. But um, uh, no, yeah, they even got used to it and now they enjoy it. And, and we are family people in the band, like it's extended family. So all the relationships are very close knit all across the board at this point. Anything you would like to say to a young metal vocalist just starting their journey? There is no trade-off for discipline. And I'm not a disciplined person, but somehow I was able to trick myself, I guess, because I was so passionate about it. Nothing, there are no shortcuts to those 10,000 hours or whatever the saying goes. So, you know, 
you have to stay later than the other bands in the rehearsal room. You have to be more ambitious with your songwriting that even when you start out, like in your mind, I think you have to, you can't compete with other guys in your or girls in your age bracket or anything like that. You have to, you know, look on the top of the pyramid and like, at least in my mindset. And, you know, you want to challenge Metallica and Iron Maiden, you know, like you have somewhere to really see what your full potential is. You have to have these really high flown goals and no one will see that in you in the beginning. So you have to see it uh, until everybody else does. So it's just work. So make sure that this is something, make sure you enjoy it for what it is, not just for what it may or may not become. Because I believe even if we wouldn't be in a somewhat nice position now as a band, as far as career and paying bills goes, I mean, I still don't have a gold plated shark tank with little shark with little lasers on their head at home, but I, you know, I can buy coffee and milk and uh, both me and the dog get to eat. So, I mean, so it's, it's something, um, but I truly believe that even if that wouldn't have happened the way it has at this point, I still would consider dedicating my life to music and to create being the best decision of my life because everything else that it's given us through the years. So, you, you know, just, um, you need, you need to love the hard part as well, because there's no getting around it. Thank you. Thank you.